truck drivers, the heroes of the world and the champions of our hearts. This one's just for you, boys and girls. Keep on trucking. Once again, it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. This experience happened to me in October 2018, and I've decided after much deliberation to tell it here. So I work as a delivery driver for a company that deals in your big household utensils. You know, fridges, cookers, things like that. Well, I don't want to give any details on the company or the employer, but I'll just say I'm based in the Missouri area. Now, before I begin, just a little backstory on me. I'm an expat from Liverpool in England, which will explain certain things. And, uh, well, I met my lovely wife eight years ago when she was on holidays, and we hit it off. After a year of long distance back and forth, I finally made the jump and moved to the US to be with her. And we've been happily married ever since. Anyway, my job often involves long hours on the road, sometimes late into the night. Well, there was me and a young kid. We'll call him Pete, and he's the boss's son. We get along well enough, even though we don't have anything in common. Pete's your typical 20-something kid, usually glued to his phone. And I'm in my 40s, so yeah, what can you do? We don't even like the same sports. He's into his baseball, and I'm still a die-hard Liverpool fan. But we used to shit-talk a lot on the road, and it makes the job easier on deliveries to have two people doing the lifting instead of one. So, it's near the end of October. Myself and Pete are just finishing up for the day when I get a call from the boss man. He tells me to head back to the pickup for one last order. This isn't anything new, mind you. Logistics is a mess at the company sometimes. When I hang up, Pete flips his lid as usual, and I take it in my stride. Pete starts going off on his dad about how things are a mess at the company, and that if he were running things, there'd be no last-minute deliveries. I just mind my business, as usual. It wasn't the first time I'd heard that spiel. Pete's dad had put him on deliveries to teach him the value of good work, while he was completing a business degree at night classes in college. Problem was, he often missed those classes when we were called for some late-night duties, so I could understand the kid's frustrations. So we head back to the store and pick up a large refrigerator, all packed neatly in a cardboard box, and then load it onto the truck. I got the location up on the phone, and we set off for the long drive. Oh, Pete was still pissed because he had some drinking plans with some friends that night, so he was mute for the hour-long journey. I put on the radio and just chilled before calling the wife, letting her know to put the dinner into the microwave. So, there we are on these pitch-dark back roads out in the sticks. I'm glancing at the phone every so often, noting that we're getting closer to our destination. We hadn't seen a house in ages, and I was getting antsy that maybe the directions were wrong. Sure enough, the phone lets me know that we'd reached the end of the line. I slowed down, peering out the windscreen at the dark country lane, completely covered with trees on both sides, the only light coming from the truck's headlights. I crawl to a stop, and Pete glances up from his phone. He looks at me and asks what's going on. I tell him we've reached our destination. Oh, for fuck's sake, don't tell me Dad gave us the wrong directions. He starts going off on his dad again, and I tell him just to settle down. I was annoyed with myself, but I didn't want to hear another bout. Pete just shrugged and settled back to gazing at his phone, muttering to himself. I called the boss and let him know the situation. He assured me that they were the right directions, and tells me to call the client. I take a look at the docket and get the number. Enter it on the phone and hit dial. No answer. I try again. Still no answer. Oh, Pete gets out of the truck telling me he has to take a piss. I watched him walk into the dark edge of the road and called the boss again. He tells me I need to make that delivery, otherwise we'll be behind for the rest of the week. Then he instructs me to keep trying to call the client, drive up the road a bit to see if we can find the house. Well, I mumbled a half-hearted, yeah, and hung up. Even though these late-night, last-minute deliveries were a regular occurrence, I never considered leaving the job. I mean, the boss is a decent enough fella, even if a little scattered, and the pay is good, as well as the holiday leave. 
So, I'm waiting in the truck for a while, when I realize there's no sign of Pete. I get out and call his name. No answer. I tried looking into the pitch dark, but couldn't see shit. I called out for him again. Still nothing. I was getting slightly worried and decided to walk down the road a bit, the truck's engine humming steadily behind me. I shout out. Hey, Pete, stop messing around. He finally answers, and I let out a sigh of relief. The last thing I wanted was losing the boss's son in the middle of nowhere. I saw the white of his t-shirt under his open jacket, jogging up the road towards me. I asked him what the frick he was doing. He points at a faint light through the trees behind him. Well, I saw that light and thought it might be the place. I walked down the road to see if there's a way in. I found a gate in behind some bushes below. We get back in the truck and I reverse it down the road. He points me to the gate. Sure enough, it's tucked back in behind a sharp turn, almost invisible. No wonder we hadn't seen it on the way up. We both had the same look on our faces, saying, oh, This must be it. After some tricky maneuvering, we're heading up a patchy gravel drive. Some of the tree branches were so thick and bowed, we could hear them scraping off the top of the truck. A few minutes later, the house comes into view. It was an old house that you'd think was abandoned if not for the lights coming from inside. It had one of those surrounding porches that you'd see in the rich suburbs. The wooden boardings on the walls were all flaked and peeling, like they'd never seen a lick of paint. Some old work sheds stood off to the side, doors fastened shut. The only thing out of place was a nice-looking, expensive car that was parked in the drive, which meant to me that somebody must be at home. I swung the truck around and backed it up to the front door, then shut off the engine. We got out and I told Pete to get the fridge on the trolley. While he opened the back and went to task, I walked up to the front door, the decking creaking under my boots, and gave it a sharp knock. I waited for an answer in what would have been a still quiet night, if not for the noise of Pete bringing the fridge down on the mechanical ramp. I knocked again and waited some more. Pete made his way over to the steps leading up to the porch, trolley in hand. Well, maybe they're not home, he said. Well, There's a car here and the lights are on, I replied. So, what if there's something wrong? Yeah, this place is creepy as fuck. I shook my head and smiled. Before that day, I didn't go in for all that stuff. Well, it wasn't the first time I had to make my rounds out in ass crack nowhere and I was used to so-called creepy houses in the night. But not after that night. I was about to knock for a third time when I heard movement from inside. I turned to Pete and gave him a wink, saying, Here we go. The door opened, and a young, slight woman was standing in front of us. She was pale and sweaty, with her long, dark hair tied in a bun. She was wearing this striped black and pink jumper. That's a detail I'll never forget. It was just so odd. Actually, her whole demeanor was odd from the get-go. She looked like she was sick, like she was just getting over the flu or something. Well, I put on my best smile and told her we were here to deliver the fridge, apologizing for the late call. She stared at me, confused. I showed her the docket and confirmed the address and name. She looked back up at me with her dark eyes, and the confused look left her face. Oh yeah, I forgot that was today. Sorry, come in. She stood aside and I helped Pete get the fridge up the steps. Inside, the house was well kept, but a little old-fashioned with a faint, musty smell. A few pictures hung on the walls of a little girl and an older woman, which I guess must have been her mother. There were also some various age photos of her mother, looking younger and holding a baby surrounded by groups of other people in what must have been a large camp in some woods. I don't know why that detail comes to mind, but there you go. Certainly as to the weird shit that went down in that house when I think about it. She led us into the kitchen, and I asked if she wanted us to take the old fridge away. Well, it's part of the service we provide. She said yes, and we got to work unplugging the old model. Oh, you don't mind emptying it, do you? She said quietly. There's not much in it. 
I opened the door and, sure enough, it was pretty much empty. No bother, miss, I told her. As I took out the few meagre items, Pete started unboxing the new fridge. All the while, she's just standing there, looking at us silently while scratching her arm. Eventually, she's rocking back and forth on her feet, looking jittery. Will you excuse me? she said quietly. Without waiting for an answer, she took off down the hallway. Pete gave me a look and whispered, She's a strange one. Yeah, I think she's using it, I whispered back. What? Drugs. Heroin, you know. See her scratching her arm? She's all sweaty and sick. Well, I've seen similar types of behavior before when a drug user is looking for a fix. Oh, shit. I think you're right, Pete replied. Look, let's just get this one done quick, I said. Well, we put the new fridge in place and heaved the old one onto the trolley in no time. There was no sign of the woman as we headed back outside to load it into the truck. I told Pete to go lock it up, and I went back inside to get her digital signature on the pad. I called for her, but there was no answer. I went to the kitchen. She wasn't there either. On the way back to the front door, I spotted an open door up a short hallway. Now, I'm not one to go snooping around someone's house, but I'm also a stickler for procedure if not for covering my own ass more than anything else. I don't want some asshole claiming they never got their item and putting me in the shit while I have to prove they did. So, I just wanted to get the signature, end a long night and go home. I made my way up to the door and saw it led down to the basement. I could see a faint light coming from below. Miss, are you down there? I said in a somewhat loud voice and waited in the silent house. I then heard something like radio static drift up from the basement. Ah, maybe she didn't hear me, I thought. Maybe she's listening to music or something, which is why she didn't hear us knocking at first. And then, hmm, maybe she's using. The whole situation fell out of place, if you get what I mean. Still, I began to make my way slowly down the steps and repeated myself in a louder voice. To be honest, even I was starting to get a little creeped out. I jumped when I heard Pete whisper behind me. What's going on? I think she's down here, I said quietly. Let's just go, he said in a worried voice. Well, I put up a front, smiled at him and said, What? You're afraid of that little girl? He gave me a look telling me he didn't care what I thought. I think he knew I was uneasy too. What if she's shooting up or something? Hardly, I replied. Ah, she wouldn't be that stupid to do that while we're in the house. You know, I was trying to rationalize that idea to myself rather than Pete. Still, I motioned us down and called for her again. Still no answer. As we reached the end of the steps, the static noise was louder. There was a closed door in a small hallway to our left, leading to the rest of the basement. And I was about to knock it down when I heard what sounded like a young girl's voice talking through the static. I looked back at Pete and his eyes were wide open. Then we heard mumbling coming from the strange woman. It sounded like she was talking to the little girl. Oh, I mouthed at Pete. What the fuck? And he was busy looking back up the steps, obviously ready to sprint at the first sign of trouble. I went to the open door and he grabbed me by the shoulder, shaking his head. No. Maybe she's talking to someone over a radio or something, I whispered. Just forget the signature, he replied quickly. Oh, look, we're just freaking ourselves out at this stage, Pete, I said abruptly, trying to get a handle on the situation. With that, I knocked on the door and opened it, saying, Miss? What I saw in that room below that old house will stay with me for the rest of my life. It was the freakiest shit I've ever seen. And believe me, growing up on the mean streets of Liverpool, I've seen some shit. Homeless people beating the crap out of each other over a newspaper. A guy stabbed in the neck on a night out. But well, this one topped them all. The woman was sitting on this large steel plate with her back to us, 
which was attached to some kind of weird machine. There was what looked like a speaker system suspended in the middle of it, with an antenna on top. Coming out of the plated sides were all these flexible tubes with needles on the end of them, lying on the floor like still tentacles. All except one, which was inserted into her arm. She was in this deep, trance-like conversation with the little girl's voice coming out of the speaker. I can't remember what they were saying because I was in shock. Pete stood still beside me, mouth open. In that moment, my mind was all over the place because I couldn't even understand what I was seeing. But the bit that still gets me, that still makes my skin crawl to this day, is what happened next. Suddenly, the little girl's voice goes quiet through the static, and the woman does too. I could hear my heart beat violently in my ear. After a moment, the girl in the speaker says, Those two were watching us. Like, how the hell did she know we were there? Were there cameras or something? Not that I can remember, and, well, I can still see that place vividly when I close my eyes. There was this screen thing on the machine, but it was off. I can still hear that exact phrase when I think on it. That sweet little girl voice speaking in a monotone way. Those two were watching us. The woman turned to look at us, her face covered in sweat, her skin a sickly pale. We stood still like a deer in headlights. Pete was shaking visibly. Poor lad. And then she looked pissed. She stood up and said in a firm, angry tone, What the fuck are you doing? We had no answer. Pete began to back out the door, and then she shouted, What the fuck are you doing? With that, she tore the needle tube thing off her arm, and the static cut out. There was blood running down her arm, mixed with this strange, yellowish fluid. Pete bolted up the stairs, and the woman started walking towards me. This is private, she shouted, pointing a bloody finger at me. I got my senses back quick at that and rushed up the stairs. Signature be damned. Now, I'm a big guy physically, but I was freaked out and I'm not ashamed to admit it. I wasn't afraid of her so much as I was afraid of the whole situation combined together, if you catch my drift. Behind me, I heard the door slam and her roaring from the other side. Get the fuck out of my house! I was happy to oblige and quickly swung the front door shut on my way to the truck. I jumped inside where Pete was waiting for me, fear in his eyes. I shakily got the keys out of my jacket pocket and started the engine. Oh, let's get the hell out of here, I said. Pete didn't reply, and I drove us down that narrow gravel drive as fast as I could, the tree branches bouncing noisily off the roof. I clipped the pier of the gate on the way out onto the road, but I didn't care. The boss could just dock it off my pay. We didn't say anything for quite a while on the way back. Eventually, Pete said, What was that? I don't know, but I don't even want to think about it. I replied in a shaky voice. Neither do I, Pete said. Well, he must have formed a silent agreement because we never mentioned it again on the rest of the drive back to the store, or even after that. I never even told my wife. I mean, who would have believed us anyway? It all sounds so crazy. At home base, we led on to the boss that it was just another normal delivery. I told him that I dented the bumper on the gate because it was such a tight turn, which was partly true. He told me not to worry about it and thanked us for doing the job. As I said, he's a decent enough fella. He did a few more jobs with me after that, but eventually quit much to his dad's disappointment. Well, I don't blame him. If I was a young lad, I would have too. But I need this job. Last I heard, he left town to go to college full-time. Well, hope it works out for him. And I got paired up with an old hippie guy in his 60s. We've got more in common, so, well, there's that. And I still do the odd late-night delivery, but not as much. I had a stern talk with the boss about cutting back on those shifts, I wanted to spend more time with my wife. Now, 
I do have questions, of course. Like, what the hell was that machine thing? What was that woman with her black and pink striped jumper doing with it? What was that little girl's voice? But, well, what I said to Pete that night still holds true. I don't want to think about it. At least, not too much. Still, though, when I do make that odd late-night run, that experience always plays at the back of my mind. Writing this down and getting my story out there is kind of like closure for me. I just want to put the whole experience behind me. Oh, one more thing. Pete, not his real name, went missing in mid-August. At first we thought he bailed on college. My boss still thinks that, but I'm not so sure anymore. I think he's dead. Some of his friends on social media think it might have been suicide. If so, maybe what we saw that night had a greater effect on him than I'd originally thought. Also, my missus told me something that got me rattled last night. I don't know how we got to it, but, but she brought up an incident with a woman who called to the house around that time who was looking for me. Said it had to do with insurance or something. I pressed my wife for a description of some sort, and besides telling me she was wearing a smart suit, the woman was very sickly looking with dark hair and strange eyes. I had to suppress my shock, and told her I had no idea who it was. Anyway, my wife had completely forgotten about the whole thing, because our life was a little chaotic. We were helping with search parties for Pete, and it had slipped her mind. If it was that same woman, and she had something to do with Pete's disappearance, then, I'll be honest, I'm starting to freak here. I'm thinking I should go to the cops, but I'm afraid they'll laugh in my face. Plus, that woman hasn't been seen around since, so what could they charge her with? For now, I'm just going to play it cool and carry on. Hopefully, Pete shows up, one way or another. And maybe that woman calling was a coincidence. I never knew what she worked as. Maybe she was a door-to-door insurance person or something. Maybe I'm just thinking too much about all this. When I was in college, I got a great job delivering furniture for this well-established mom-and-pop operation. This was the late 90s, so there was no background check, no drug test or anything like that. My dorm mate, Daniel, had gotten a job there with me the same day, so it was pretty rad. I'm not a very private person, but I think everyone has some inherent amount of nosiness about them. Delivering furniture to people includes the bizarre social contracts wherein complete strangers ask other complete strangers to come into their home. I remember after my very first day of work, being astounded by just how much crazy I had witnessed. And the creepiest part is that it wasn't some big guy or some sideshow freak. It was a little old lady. So, my first delivery was a very expensive, very heavy bedroom set. A chest of drawers, a dresser with a big mirror and top set, and two nightstands. We got everything loaded on the truck and made sure we had the address and owner's name, Ms. Nettie Carroll, and we headed out. My college was in an area that consisted of three to four mid-sized cities, surrounded by many smaller rural towns. This delivery was going to a town I'd heard of, but had never visited. <laughs> this was before any of us had access to Google Maps, so we grabbed the map out of the glove box and hit the road. We left the city and started getting into the more rural area. Lots of trailers, lots of dilapidated older homes, extreme poverty on the outskirts. We finally reached the address for the county road where the house was located and saw that it was, apparently, at the end of a very long driveway. It was around noon, in the middle of the Alabama summer, so it was oppressively hot outside. 
When we reached the bend at the end of the driveway, we saw that, inexplicably, there was a gorgeous Victorian-style home. My co-worker said, Well, this doesn't belong here. I approached the house and knocked on the door. I waited. Nothing. I knocked again and gave it a 30 count before realizing that there was an old school metal door knocker. You know, the kind with the metal plate and ring that you lift and then bang against the frame. Eventually, I heard the door's lock disengage. And there stood a little old lady probably about five feet tall, a perfect little puffball of white hair on her head, wearing a blue and yellow floral print dress. I didn't say anything at first because I was literally unable to comprehend what I was seeing on her face. She had on gobs and gobs of pasty peach-coloured makeup, bright red lipstick and blue eyeshadow. It was literally caked on. It looked as though she'd used upward strokes on her eyeshadow because it gave her face an expression of perpetual surprise. I would later in the day describe to my drinking buddies in my dorm as it <laughs> looked like she put that shit on with a shotgun. And my God, the perfume. She had on so much that, standing away from her doorway about three or four feet, I could taste it. In smaller doses, it might have smelled like green apples, but the volume that she'd chosen to wear gave it a poisonous smell, not unlike insecticide. Eventually, I was able to say something along the lines of, Um, I, I'm here to deliver your bedroom set. I found I was able to carry on if I pretended to have something very important to look at on my delivery sheet instead of looking at the lady. Now, I'm a big guy, 6'1 and around 235 pounds. I played football in school, grew up rough and so on. But this little old woman terrified the living shit out of me and shit was about to get much, much weirder. She welcomed us. Daniel, I found, had come up to the house and was looking at the little old lady with a look of absolute astonishment. And she opened the door to an immaculately decorated anteroom with a thick red and gold oriental rug. There were exposed beams on the ceiling, beautiful, old brass fixtures, the whole nine yards. She said, y'all can come right through here and then wind around the sitting room there and just bring it all back to the main bedroom. The whole time she was very flirty, very coquettish. Daniel and I went into the back of the delivery truck and exchanged, what the fucks? And did you see? Before trying to get our shit together long enough to load the dresser on the dolly. We got back to the front porch and found that the door was standing open. So we eased the dresser through the front door and waited in the sitting room with the dresser on the dolly. As we stood there, it dawned on me that I had anticipated coming into the house and cooling off, but it was just as hot inside the house as it was outside, around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Daniel was whispering around the edge of the dresser. Man, this is jacked up. This poor old woman is fucking crazy. When I whispered back, do you hear that? He stopped, half cocked his head to the side, and then said, no, what is it? I said, really? Listen. Dun, 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 Sounds like a xylophone. <laughs> you don't hear that. Fed up with me, Daniel said, Dude, what, what the fuck are you even saying? <laughs> Wait, I do hear it. 
About that time, Ms. Carroll came back into the front of the house and said, All right, I've gotten everything moved about for you strapping gentlemen. Which she followed up with this creepy, girlish giggle. We followed her through the sitting room with the dresser on the dolly, carefully dodging all manner of expensive-looking heirloom furniture and knick-knack. As he backed down the hall, Daniel leaned around the dresser again and whispered, Getting louder! I realized he was right, and it was definitely a xylophone. We stopped outside a massive bedroom with similarly expensive-looking decor and set the dresser up on end. I was looking at the doorframe, considering how best to get the dresser into the room, when it dawned on me why I recognized the music coming down the hallway. Here, in the house of this creepy little old lady who lived in a million dollar home, out in the woods with no air conditioning, I was hearing the unmistakable hook from the song Girls by the Beastie Boys. What? The actual fuck. For some reason, this actually broke the hair on the back of your neck feeling I'd had since arriving, <laughs> and I had to chuckle. But that was to be a short lived break. Ms. Carroll squeezed past us and back up the hall with a ooh, tight squeeze. And Daniel and I had a good laugh while we were getting the dresser moved into the room and up against the wall. When we finished moving it, we fastened the mirror onto the top and went back to the truck. To Ms. Carroll I said, So, is the rest of this going into the same bedroom? To which she replied, No, the two nightstands and the chest of drawers would be going down the hall. I resisted the urge to say, you mean the Beastie Boys room? And Daniel and I went to the truck. We loaded the chest of drawers on the big dolly and the two nightstands on the smaller one, then went back inside. Once we got to the end of the hall, I noticed that the other bedroom door was open and Ms. Carroll was standing in the hallway. She cooed. Right this way, boys. All of that is going in here. I was pushing the smaller dolly with the two nightstands, so I rounded the corner first and realized two things almost immediately. Number one, my name that tune skills are right on. And number two, hey, so there's a mostly naked girl laying across the bed. No, really. The girl looked to be in her mid to late twenties, and she was laying perpendicular across the bed in a bikini, sound asleep. True to form, Girls by the Beastie Boys was blaring from her CD player. I realized we'd been hearing it for over an hour, and that it had to have been playing on repeat. Ms. Carroll finally seemed to notice the girl and said, Misty, cover yourself. Then she looked at me with that fantastically horrifying makeup on her face and winked. At some point, I realized that I was rushing as fast as I could to get out of there, and Daniel seemed to be doing the same. We got the chest of drawers put together in record time, all the while sweating like crazy because there was no air conditioning at all. As we were finishing, Misty apparently had enough. She sat up, eyes closed, and yelled, I'm trying to fucking sleep. I told you I didn't even want that shit in here, Nettie. Not Grandmama, not Granny, not Mama, but Nettie, Misty still with her eyes closed, rolled over and went soundly to sleep. This sent Nettie into a rage. 
She starts yelling in this shrill, high-pitched scream. You can get out of my house, you filthy cocksucker! And on and on and on. Horrible, horrible name-calling. Accusations and the like. Just a complete 180 from the sweet little old southern lady with the scary makeup into this foul-mouthed, shrieking monster. <laughs> At some point, I'd backed her all the way against the far wall of the room, and I found myself with nowhere left to go. Just when I thought things were about to go to psycho overdrive, Daniel calmly and politely chimes in. Uh, where would you like this nightstand? Without taking a breath, Ms. Carroll replied, Oh, right over there on the far side of the bed, if you don't mind. Thank you. We quickly had her sign the paperwork and hightailed it out of there. As I was going back out of the front drive, Daniel said, Hit it, dude. I swear to God, Leatherface is going to come busting out of that front door any minute now. I want to begin by saying that I've been an over-the-road trucker for the past two years now. Ever since I was 21, and I honestly love what I do, even if it's for ungrateful people. But during the past two years, I've seen some unnatural things on the road. Things that have some, well, things that have no real explanation. Some feel evil, others just odd. I'll begin with the one that most people who are, or who have family in an industry, have experienced or at least have heard of, the Black Dog. I won't go into too much detail, but every commercial driver has to follow hours of service regulations stating you can drive no more than 11 hours a day, and you can't be on duty more than 14. If either are met, it requires a 10-hour rest break. Now, seeing the Black Dog is caused by your brain forcing a shutdown because of fatigue while you're driving. It happens so quickly, you fall asleep with your eyes open, blending reality and the dream state, causing well, hallucinations. The old wives' tale states that if you see the black dog, well, <laughs> it's time to get some rest. Some say the dog is there to protect people from getting into accidents, sort of like a guardian angel. But after this experience... I think there's more to it than everything previously stated. Six months in, as an over-the-road driver, I had a delivery to make in Tonawanda, New York, and was coming up through Pennsylvania on one of the state routes. It was right around 10pm, and I still had about three hours left to drive. Now, I can't stress this part enough. I wasn't even remotely tired. I came around a winding set of curves on this route through the forest. I came around a blind left curve, and there I saw it. A black dog, come darting out into the road. I was travelling at 50 miles an hour, with 42,900 pounds in the trailer. There was no way I could stop in time. I stabbed into the brakes, and then I felt the thud. Yes, I felt the truck hit this dog. There's no way it would survive being hit by 76,000 pounds at 50 miles an hour. When I finally came to a stop, about 400 feet later, I pulled off as far to the right as I could and turned on my four ways. I stepped down out of the truck and walked around to the front. No damage. No blood. No scratches. No anything. I walked all the way back to where I'd hit the dog. No blood, no mangled mess of bone and fur. There was nothing. I went back and grabbed my flashlight out of the truck and started heading to where I'd hit it to look around. If it was someone's dog, they had a right to know what had happened. I searched for this dog for 30 minutes and found nothing. I was completely confused, but I gave up the search and turned to walk back to my truck. As I turned, I got chills down my spine. 
The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I broke out in a cold sweat. The dog was sitting just below my driver's side mirror, staring at me. I could only see it because of the amber marker light on the side of my truck. I decided to shine my flashlight on the dog, but as soon as the beam of light hit it, it just vanished. Gone. My gut told me it was time to get out of Dodge. I ran back to my truck, climbed inside, locked the doors, released my brakes, and booked it down the road. For the next five miles, I swear, I kept seeing this black dog on the side of the road, just staring back up at me. Something didn't feel right about it at all. It was always staring at me, always expressionless. It didn't do anything but sit there. But well, it would disappear, and then I'd see it again. A fear I've never felt before started creeping up on me. I was legitimately scared at that point. I didn't know what to do. There was nowhere with enough space for a 73-foot combination vehicle to turn around. This delivery needed to happen. So, as they say, I kept on trucking. Fifteen miles later, weird things started to happen. My interior lights would turn themselves off and on. My headlights would flicker erratically. I began to lose air pressure from my brakes, which is not good. If your air pressure drops below 20 to 40 PSI, there's not enough air pressure to keep the springs held back from applying both the truck and trailer brakes full force. I got down to 60 PSI. The low air warning light came on. And I pulled over to the side of the road, applied my brakes and four ways and got out to check what was making me lose air pressure. All of my airlines were severed. It looked as if they were bitten clean in half. The airlines on big trucks are designed to withstand 150 psi of outward pressure and something just bit them in half like it was nothing. I'd notified dispatch of the breakdown put out my reflective triangles, and waited. An hour had passed, and I didn't see a damn thing. Another 18-wheeler was coming up in my rears, so I switched on my CB into channel 19, which is the common channel, and radioed to keep to the left, as there was a very small shoulder, and I was about halfway into the lane of travel. He radioed back. 10-4. Thanks for the heads-up, driver. Everything all right? So? I radio back. Yeah, airlines are busted. Waiting on the wrecker to get here. He didn't respond after that. He came past me without slowing down, easily doing 60 in a 45 zone. I watched him follow the curve to the left. Then, brake lights. I heard the screeching of tires and watched as he swerved off the road and into a pine tree. I climbed out of my truck and ran over to him. The truck was smashed in, and a branch was pierced through the windshield. I quickly opened up the driver door, and there I saw it. The branch had impaled him through the shoulder, just above the armpit. Blood was leaking out of the area, but the branch was acting like a plug almost, preventing excessive blood loss. The driver was unconscious. I immediately called 911, gave them the state route and mile marker of the accident, the nature of his wounds. They notified EMS and the state police right away. Twenty minutes later, they arrived. They had to use a saw to cut the branch, both in front and behind the driver. They had to carry him down from the truck to the gurney. He finally came to. He started crying, not out of pain, but remorse. The only thing he kept saying was, Did I hit her? Did I hit that poor girl? I was taken aback by shock. The last house I'd passed was three miles away, and there were no houses in sight of this stretch of the road. The ambulance rushed him off to the hospital. The police notified the towing company to come and get its truck, and called his company to inform them. I gave the state police my witness statement. And shortly after, the wrecker for my truck arrived, along with a relay driver to finish my delivery. The tow man 
took a look at my airlines. All he said was, You saw it, didn't you? The dog, you saw it. Shaken, I replied, Yes. All I got back was, It saved your life, kid. Remember that. We got the truck hooked up, and I was on my way, having it towed to a dealership about 30 miles away. That was the last time I ever saw the black dog. Well, so far, at least. I don't know what it is, what it wants, why it chooses who it does. All I know is that it saved my life. So, if in your travels you ever see the black dog, pull over immediately. I have plenty more stories to tell, but I don't know if people want to hear them. Let me know and I'll try to get more written down. Oh, and after doing some research, the nearest houses to where this took place, well, there aren't any family homes. No children whatsoever. This is an actual encounter with Bigfoot, and I believe it's worth sharing. So I'm fishing down at Cadogan. It's on the Allegheny River in western Pennsylvania. So I parked out at the top of the ramp going down to the river. Not a boat ramp, just one for backing four-wheel drives down to the water. I go up and it's getting to be just about twilight, when I can hear something coming down the hillside across from us. Well, it's steep, but not too steep. Anyway, I hear it barreling down the hillside, but the brush is thick and really high, about a part of twelve feet. Now I'm waiting for a black bear to hop onto the road, but it doesn't. It just stops in the middle of the last brush, right beside the road. Well, still thinking it was a bear, I go ushering my friend and his four-year-old daughter back down to the river. There's a bunch of rocks there from baseball to basketball size, so they can defend themselves. I'm still up at my car because I'm less than five feet from my door, and this brush is a good thirty feet away, so I know I can make it to my car and distract it with my horn and engine. And yet, it never leaves the brush. Just shakes it violently. I stand there for about five minutes. I can see it make its way up the hill. I didn't realize, but it was pushing the trees around it, about twenty feet tall. I'm sure I wasn't connecting anything because of my adrenaline. I hadn't even seen it. It was too dark by that point. So I walk back down to the river. We're gathering up our stuff. And this is getting way too creepy. We start packing up. I can hear a knocking coming from the hillside. I see a group of people down river from us, but they aren't near any trees. They're actually on an outcrop and about twenty feet away from the tree line. And this knocking is above us and slightly up river. Even they reacted to it, looking around and whatnot. I yelled to them about it possibly being a bear. They said they'd heard something coming down the hillside and seen my buddy running towards the water. They thanked us for the heads up. As soon as they thanked us, a rock came flying off the hillside in between us and them. We actually saw the rock hit the water. They jumped as I did. We weren't really expecting it. I turned around to see if my friend was up on the hill and was messing with us. And as I turned, I saw he was just a few feet behind me, holding his daughter. And both were as white as a ghost. And none of us were expecting that. I decided to reach down and grab a rock, and carried it with me just in case it got real. Three more times we heard these rocks hitting the water, and I'd just had enough. Our site was all cleaned up, and I took that as a perfect time to retaliate. Well, not my best decision, but I knew where these stones were being thrown from, a damn brush up there. And so, I chucked it. I knew there weren't any trees around I figured if I threw it, it would probably just blow right through it. But it didn't. It made a sound like someone who's beating their chest, and it rolled back out towards me. I actually heard whatever I hit get the wind knocked out of it, and it hit the hillside. 
took off down the road towards the other group. Now they start screaming, and I mean a life being threatened, utter scream of terror. And they start throwing whatever they could grab at it. I'm just standing there bewildered and watching them scatter. A few went into the water and the rest ran towards me. All of a sudden, someone yells, Get in the truck! Now they took off in their truck, and I mean, they left everything. Nobody grabbed a thing. They just took off. I'll never forget their screams. Well, I ran back up the hill and hopped into my car. My buddy ran up with his daughter right after they started shouting. And he was crying. I've known this man for 20 years, and I can count on one hand how many times I'd seen him cry. I started up my car, and we hightailed it out of there. Well, I never saw exactly what it was, but when I put everything together later that night. It's been five years since it happened, and, and he absolutely refuses to go back down there. Damn shame, too, because it's an amazing catfish spot. I was traveling through a very rural part of Iowa, later at night, probably around 10pm. I was doing my best to avoid interstates and US routes because the trailer I was pulling did not have sliding tandems, and as a result my trailer axle was overweight. I didn't want to be hit with a thousand dollar fine, and an axle overweight on my CSA score as a result of having to pull into a way station. For those of you who don't know a lot about Iowa, it's a very flat state for the most part, and it's also home to the world's largest truck stop, the Iowa 80. I'd stopped there previously to pick up a few things and visit the trucker's museum next to it. It's a place I'd recommend anyone to visit, trucker or not. I'd left there and began my travels again, avoiding roads that were weight restricted or had low clearance locations. Most trailers stand 13 foot 6 inches. And any time clearance is close to that, on a bridge, it's a full pucker. Mainly because in some places the roads get repaved, and they don't update clearance height notifications. I was about 30 miles away from any municipality in all directions, when my CB radio started playing various pitches of static. Usually this means someone is talking on the CB, but they're out of range. I pulled my mic off the hangar and tried to communicate. I got no response, yet I still kept hearing the various pitches of static. I continued driving and came upon an underpass to a road that had no clearance height notifications. I immediately pulled off to the side of the road, not wanting the top of my trailer to look like the lid of an open can of sardines. I checked my road atlas for the road I was on. No clearance restrictions, and this was a brand new atlas. The bridge in front of me looked very old. Not seeing anything to suggest I didn't have the clearance, I slowly crept forward under the bridge. I was relieved to fully clear the bridge and continue driving. But that relief was short-lived. I looked into my mirrors after passing under the bridge, and a chill crept up my spine. There was no bridge there. That's when things started getting really weird. I looked back forward and realized there were no houses, no trees, no mailboxes, no cars, or anything worth more. Just this long stretch of road. That's when my CB began to ring out with very old-timey music. It was blaring in volume, so I turned it down. I immediately pulled over again, got out my phone. No reception. My Qualcomm had no connection. My GPS had no satellite signal. My normal radio had shut off. I tried making calls and sending messages through the Qualcomm. Calls didn't get through and messages didn't send. I had no choice but to drive this seemingly endless stretch of road. So I kept driving. After about an hour, I realized that nothing was changing. The moon in the sky hadn't moved. My fuel hadn't gone down. There was still nothing but road and fields off to the sides. I continued to drive. My Qualcomm was non-functioning, and at this point I said to hell with the hours of service regulations. 
I drove for eight more hours, until I was so tired I couldn't drive any more. I decided it best to shut down and try to get some sleep, and then it hit me. The entire time I'd been out here, I hadn't been hungry or thirsty. Nothing seemed to change at all. I laid awake for a while, before finally falling asleep. I woke up with the rising sun. I sat up and realized that things weren't right. I woke up in a bed, inside a room, undoubtedly inside a house. Someone walked inside the room and said, Good morning, sweetie. Breakfast is ready downstairs. I felt this undying urge to call her mom. So I did. I told her I'd be down in a minute. She was wearing a dress similar to that you'd see in the 1920s. I realized everything here was wrong, but I was being assimilated into this kid's life. I couldn't do anything about it. Panic questions would pop up in my head, but I could never voice them. It was as if I was in the back seat and someone else was driving. I remember crying in my head, but the tears never fell from my eyes. I lived for 70 years in that existence. In time I'd come to know my name was Edward. I graduated high school, fell in love, got married, had kids, had a stable job, became a grandfather, and I died. I lived every single day of that existence, always knowing it wasn't right, but not being able to do anything about it for almost 26,000 days. Oh, I'd missed my family so much. In my head, I'd cried every single day, knowing I would never see my family again. The despair I felt growing every day was unimaginable. Eventually, I just stopped caring and tried to enjoy as much of this life as I could. When my eyes closed that final time, I was awoken by a loud tapping sound. I was back in my truck, and a wave of hunger and thirst so intense hit me that it buckled me to my knees. I went to my window, and there was a state trooper requesting for me to get moving. So, I started driving again, and pulled over at the nearest area I could. I ate and drank like I hadn't eaten anything in years. I looked down at my phone. I had 17 missed calls. 10 from dispatch, 5 from my mother, and 2 from some random number. Four days had passed. I was asleep on the side of this road for four days, after living another life for 70 years. I refuse to go to Ira anymore, and dispatch doesn't send me there, although I've never told them what happened. I never tried to do any research on what happened, did not want to know about it. I'm now still wary of any bridge or underpass, regardless of whether it's in a populated area or not. The worst part is, to this day, I sometimes still have trouble remembering that my name isn't Edward. So yeah, I've had a few um, true stories come up on the uh, subreddit uh, recently. I thought, well, good opportunity to cobble them all together into a, an anthology video on the theme of uh, truck drivers and the weird things they've seen. Now, if you're a truck driver, as I said, this is dedicated to you. You really are the heroes of the world. What would we do without you? But if you've got any weird stories, please um, consider sending them to me. I'd love to uh, read more in the, in a similar vein to what I did tonight. So. Well, there you go. Open invitation. Looking forward to it. Uh, that's enough for me for this beautiful, beautiful Friday evening. I'll be back on Sunday with um, a continuation of one of the serials I'm doing. Maybe the next episode of Breach? Not sure. Till then, very, very sweet dreams, everyone. And bye-bye.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?